Corey, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie back with Graham Hancock, who has become recognized as an unconventional thinker who raises legitimate questions about humanity's history and prehistory and offers an increasingly popular challenge to the views of orthodox scholars. He graduated from Durham University with first-class honors in sociology. He then went on to pursue a career in quality journalism, writing for many of Britain's leading newspapers. He's a noted author as well, one of his recent books called Visionary. And, of course, he's got a series on Netflix now called Ancient Apocalypse. Graham, welcome back to the program, my friend. Hi, George. Good to be good to be with you again. I got to tell you, my daughter's my daughter's been watching your apocalypse series, and she's just riveted by it. And she told me, oh, okay. "If you ever have Graham Hancock back on the show, tell him I love that stuff." <laughs> so I'm passing it on. Thank, you. Thank your daughter very much for for watching me. Yeah, it's it's quite a breakthrough this um, this series to get um, you know big alternative ideas about. Uh, about our shared human prehistory uh, out on a on a major mainstream platform, absolutely. With um, with, a, with a you know with with a budget to really go to the locations and and produce beautiful filmography and present the story. And of course, it's driving archaeologists nuts. Um, <laughs> I've had I've had archaeological opposition to to what I do for. More than thirty years, um, and that is that is fair enough because I'm I'm saying I think, in my opinion, uh, that uh, we have lost something very important in our prehistory. I think there's been a forgotten episode during the Ice Age. I think there was something that we would recognise as a true civilization uh, in the world at that time, and this is not recognised by archaeologists uh, and um, not taught by archaeologists. So there's been a lot of anger that uh, a mainstream platform like like Netflix has allowed me to uh, express my ideas openly. But fortunately, uh, we live in a country and in countries with freedom of speech, Mm -hmm. um, and people can uh, express their own views. So despite the Society for American Archaeology writing an open letter to Netflix, basically asking them to take my series off the air or (laughs) reclassify it as fiction, Uh, apart from that attempt at censorship, which is only the latest of uh, many, uh, the fact is that this show is going to stay on the air. Uh, I do have a right of freedom of speech. Uh, I am presenting facts and evidence, although it's not evidence that archaeologists are willing to accept. uh, And if they're going to get themselves all tied up in knots, because somebody is expressing a point of view different from their own, that's their own business. I'll just say one, one more thing in this opening rant, and that is that archaeology, um, in t- when it comes to studying the prehistory of humanity, archaeology, academic archaeology, has an almost total monopoly, certainly a total monopoly when it comes to excavating uh, ancient sites but also a monopoly on information because the findings of archaeologists, the conclusions of archaeologists, the interpretations that they place upon their evidence are what is taught to us in school. We almost take it in with our mother's milk. It it, it riddles the entire education system. It dominates mainstream media presentations. This is why it's so unusual to get an alternative show on on Netflix, and and what I'm trying to do with with Agent Apocalypse is just provide some balance to that very unbalanced hyperdominance that archaeology has uh, over the interpretation of our shared and collective past. Well, you've done eight episodes. What are the possibilities of the program going into the second season with more episodes? Well, that that'll be entirely entirely up to Netflix, um, and and um, 
I, I believe that you know there's, there's there's quite a number of different factors that they take into account before commissioning a second season. There's no doubt that the open letter from the Society for American Archaeologists uh, is an attempt to censor uh, or get the show shut down. Um, I'm really astonished that people who call themselves American archaeologists, the home of freedom of speech, uh, would would attempt to to censor uh, an yeah. alternative point of view. This is a most most un-American way to behave, uh, and I think it's outrageous. But I believe Netflix will. I believe Netflix will stand by me uh, with this uh, with this first season, and uh, I hope very much we'll get a second season and dive even deeper. How long did it take to do the eight episodes? Over what time span? We didn't shoot the first episode until round about uh, November of uh, 2020, uh, and that was an episode in Malta and another episode in Turkey. And then we had various further delays through 2021. Um, more shows shot, and finally we got the last show shot during 2022, um, and now it's out there. So it's been a very long, a very long adventure. I'm, I'm glad Netflix put all episodes out at once rather than making people wait week by week. Right, uh, I, I like it because it is a whole argument. It's not just what, what, one one episode builds on another, and the the the, the whole argument builds up, up across the eight episodes until we come to the conclusion in the eight episodes but it was a it was an enormous project and, and i was lucky to have a really fantastic team of of creative and dedicated individuals who were committed to making this story and we're, we're really glad that it's out there and that people can make up their own minds whether or not the society for american archaeologists wants them to and those of us who love to binge watch this is perfect you can watch all eight episodes if you want to right away exactly, exactly. and i have to confess that's that's the way I often watch Netflix series is just to, to binge watch um, because um, you know storytelling is a storytelling is an ancient art. It's been it's been with humanity since the beginning, um, and you know we're constantly finding new ways to to reinvent the story. And I like the I like the format of an extended series, which allows it, whether, whether whether we're talking drama or, or whether we're talking documentary, it allows a it allows an argument to be unfolded, a story to be unfolded over over a fair period of time, and to draw in and involve the viewer in that story, so the viewer becomes part of the adventure and the quest. Tell me a little bit about uh, the locations you went to and how you selected them. Yes. Well, it was partly um, partly where we could get to during COVID. This was uh, this was an element. Um, and partly where I absolutely wanted to get to, and partly where authorities would allow us to get to. So although ancient Egypt is, is a very important um, element of my argument over, over more than 30 years and features very strongly in, in almost all of my books, and although we had an episode scheduled to film in Egypt, when the Egyptian authorities discovered that I was going to be presenting the episode, they denied us filming permission. Uh, and we were not able to get into Egypt. This is what I mean about archaeological censorship. Oh, Archaeologists in Egypt are particularly opposed to my work, to the notion of a lost civilization, even though the ancient Egyptians themselves spoke of receiving the gifts of civilization from the gods who were in Egypt in a former remote period called the first time that Tepi, despite... Uh, Despite that, uh, Egyptologists ignore that as myth um, and object to the idea of any precursor civilization which might in some way have influenced uh, or had an impact upon the extraordinary achievements of the ancient Egyptians themselves. And because I'm open to the idea of a lost human civilization of the Ice Age with a tradition that carried down into historical times, uh, I got banned from filming in Egypt. And... What an effective way for the archaeological lobby to censor mm -hmm. one of their main critics by denying me access uh, to a country that's very important to my argument. Is this happening um, to you all over the place? Yes, it's happening to me all over the place. It happened to me at Serpent Mound in Ohio. Uh, fortunately there, we were able to make the episode because I'd been and filmed at Serpent Mound <laughs> undercover, as it were, back in 2017, and my wife Santa is an excellent photographer, and she had um, 
a drone up and photographed the moment of the summer solstice sunset uh, over Serpent Mound back in 2017, which is a magical moment of the marriage of, of, of Earth and sky. Uh, we have friends around Serpent Mound who have land adjoining Serpent Mound. We were able to fly drones. And ultimately, I stood in front of the gates of Serpent Mound, which were closed to me, and read the letter uh, from the organization that, that runs Serpent Mound, the, the, the Ohio, um, his, his, the IC, uh, to, to say that uh, they were not, uh, because, my, because my ideas disagreed with theirs, uh, they were not going to allow me to film in the site. Uh, so, so this is, um, you know, this is just a straightforward, straightforward uh, blocking uh, and uh, censorship, uh, which which I was subjected to, and yeah, it's called the Ohio History Connection. There, exactly. Run Serpent Mound, the Ohio History Connection, and uh, they have their own very firm views about the history of Serpent Mound. They're aware from my 29 book. Uh, 2019 book, America Before, that I disagree with those views, but I think that Serpent Mound has a much older heritage than just a thousand or two thousand years, that it's alignment to the summer solstice sunset because of the changing positions of sunrise and sunset over time uh, confirms a much earlier date. Because the Ohio History Connection know this, they um, banned me from filming on the site. But nevertheless, I was largely able to exercise my freedom of speech there and say what I wanted to say about Serpent Mound, although I was not allowed to set foot upon the actual mound uh, itself. But the, the, at least we got that episode done. In, in, in Egypt, they stopped us completely from making the episode that I wanted to make on, 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 on ancient Egypt and, and on the wonders of the majesty particularly of the Temple of Horus at Edfu um, in Upper Egypt, where the story of Atlantis is told um, in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, not referring to Atlantis by name, but referring to a sacred island destroyed in a great flood, inhabited by an advanced people, leaving only a few survivors who spread around the world to, to share their knowledge. What are these people afraid of, Graham? I honestly don't know. I, I, until until this started happening to me, until archaeologists started screaming blue murder. I mean, they're also publicly in in um, in uh, social media and and in newspapers accusing accusing my my ancient apocalypse series of spreading racism and white supremacism. And this is a really low blow for a number of reasons. First of all, because there isn't a single mention of race in the entire series. I defy anybody to go through the entire episodes and find a single mention of race yet, because accusing somebody of racism and white supremacy these days is a, it produces a sort of knee-jerk reaction of horror. Archaeologists have no hesitation in accusing, accusing my series of that, even, even though race is, is, not, is not mentioned in the show. You, you are not a racist, Graham. I know and, that and, firsthand. No, and secondly, and secondly, I find it personally offensive because I'm married to a woman of color and I have, I have seven mixed-race grandchildren. <laughs> and for, them to, for them to be confronted by these kind of awful, horrible insults that are being flung at me by, in desperation by archaeologists because they just want me to shut up and go away instead of to express my views is, is frankly very annoying. Um, and and uh, discouraging for the state of the human race. Absolutely. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about, and I want to talk about the, the, your book, Visionary, later after the break. Sure. But let's talk about your thoughts of an advanced civilization that might have been here thousands of years ago. How technical do you think it was, and then what happened to them? Well, first, first of all, I don't think we should be looking for ourselves in the past. Um, my, my proposition is that we've lost an episode of the human story, but I don't think that that episode concerns uh, a highly industrialized civilization or one with mm, cell phones or, or sending people to the moon. Um, I think that uh, in terms of, in terms of their, their technological level, if we want to typecast that in our terms, probably similar to Western civilization um, in the mid to late 18th century, um, in other words, they had, be, they had been able to sail and to navigate the world. Um, they had left maps which showed the world as it looks during the Ice Age. They had um, incorporated precisely accurate relative longitudes 
on those maps. That's a big deal because our civilization didn't crack the longitude problem until the mid-18th century. Uh, before that, a shipmaster wouldn't know whether he was 300 miles east or west of a particular point, and there was always the danger of sailing into a cliff in the dead of night because you'd miscalculated. But, but uh, once the longitude problem was cracked with Harrison's chronometer, an accurate chronometer that could keep time at sea, uh, then we started putting accurate longitudes on maps ourselves from that time. But the point, the point is that those accurate longitudes exist on much more ancient maps, themselves copied from even older source maps. And, and on those old maps, we see features like Antarctica correctly displayed, which our civilization didn't discover until around the year 1820. Um, so there's a real uh, indication of a seafaring, navigating civilization that had um, explored the world, that, that understood astronomy and geometry, uh, and um, that was capable of remarkable feats. And this is where, you know, we come to a site like Gobekli Tepe mm -hmm. in Turkey, an incredibly important site, probably the most important archaeological site in the world today. And it's important because the work began there 11,600 years ago. There, you ask what wiped this civilization out. The answer is the immense, sustained, long-term global cataclysm known to geologists as the Younger Dryas. Which I'm, that's why and, and, and what hap what happened? The uh, Y A S. Well, what happened was that uh, that uh, the twelve thousand eight hundred years ago, the world the world went into a, a, a cataclysmic event. The best evidence, and maybe we'll go into this in the next segment, but the, the best evidence um, for, for for this is is the incredible rises in sea level that took place at the beginning and at the end of the Younger Dryas. This was 1,200 years of radical climate shifts. The world had been warming up. Suddenly it went incredibly cold. Sea level rose. The megafauna, the, 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 the huge fauna, megafauna of the ice age, the, the mastodons, the, the mammoths. Was like this the, Noah uh, flood time, Graham, or was that uh, much earlier? The, the story of Noah's flood is one amongst thousands of pieces of testimony that have come down to us from the ancient world. It should, in my opinion, be given no more elevation or no less elevation than any of the other hundreds and even thousands of traditions that speak of an enormous global flood that destroyed, that brought to an end a previous golden age, uh, and that often speaks of the misbehavior of the inhabitants in that previous golden age having something to do with the bringing down upon their heads of the wrath of the universe. That's the same story that Plato tells in, this, in the story of Atlantis, and it's a story that's told in, in flood myths and traditions uh, all around the world. Uh, and, and I just happen to think that Noah's flood is, is one, of those, one of those stories. And it's interesting that the Ark of Noah uh, ends up on Mount Ararat, uh, which is very close to Gobekli Tepe. Now, there was never any flood that carried seawaters as high as Mount Ararat. Let's be clear on that. But if you were the survivors of a civilization fleeing rising sea levels and, and not sure when they would stop rising, you would be smart to head for high ground. So I think Mount Ararat and other high places during, during, during the, the, the terrible events of the Younger Dryas were, were chosen as places of refuge by survivors. Graham, have you come across any stories about the ancient Vermanas, the so-called flying machines? Um, well, yes, of course. Um, in um, the, there was a period of of my research uh, around the last two years of the 1990s and the first uh, three years of the 2000s, when when I focused very very much on on ancient India um, and produced a book called uh, Underworld. At that time, yes, I mean the the ancient Egyptian, ancient Indian traditions, and, and many traditions from from around the world do. Do reference uh, flying machines. It's not. Uh, it's not a matter of uh, priority interest to me because I think there's stronger evidence uh, for a lost civilization, and I don't happen to think that the lost civilization that I'm trying to get to grips with and have spent the last 30 years trying to get to grips with was flying around the world mm -hmm. in airplanes. Maybe the Indian traditions refer to an even earlier epoch of, of lost civilization, but I'm talking about a civilization that flourished during the Ice Age, during the last uh, 100,000 years, and that was wiped out uh, between 12,800 
years ago and 11,600 years ago, just uh, yesterday in geological terms, a, a, a time that is um, remembered in myths and traditions all, all around the world. So, so, yeah, I'm aware of accounts of Bimanas in myths, uh, but I would, want to, I would want to see more than myths before, um, for example, uh, doing an episode uh, about them. But if people want to send me uh, material uh, that uh, I perhaps haven't seen before on Bimanas, I would certainly consider them for, for future investigation. They're one of the many intriguing hints and, and little gifts that we get from the past in myths and traditions that tell us that things are not exactly as we have been taught uh, in schools and universities. One of our listeners emailed me during the break and said, please ask Graham if he thinks there's other structures underneath Gobekli Tepe. There definitely are. It's a good question. And, and um, actually, this is, this is known already because the German Archaeological Institute, which has been slowly excavating at Gobekli Tepe since the mid-1990s, um, has conducted a, a thorough ground-penetrating radar survey um, of the, uh, around the whole of the hill um, of which Gobekli Tepe is a part. And uh, that ground-penetrating radar survey shows that there are dozens more of these um, circular enclosures of megaliths uh, and hundreds of large megalithic pillars, some of them looking to be in the range of 20 tons, which is about the size of the largest pillars that have so far been excavated. Hundreds of megalithic pillars still underground, uh, awaiting further excavation. Now, I have, I have mixed feelings about this because I agree with archaeologists that we should not you know, simply destroy an ancient site in order to get at all of its secrets. But I think that more work does need to be done at Gobekli Tepe. Um, to clarify whether what is what is um, pres- presently called in- in- enclosure D and the, the oldest of the enclosures and the gigantic pillars within it, which dates to 11,600 years ago, whether it is in fact the oldest enclosure, or whether there are even older enclosures still underground, which is which is perfectly possible. And and not only at Gobekli Tepe, but but at least 11 other sites have been found in a kind of ring around Gobekli Tepe, all on prominent hilltops, all indivisible. The best known and, and one that, that we filmed at for, for my Netflix series, Ancient, Ancient Apocalypse, is called Karahan Tepe, um, very recently excavated, a very spooky site. It seems to be dedicated to, to serpents. There's a semi-subterranean enclosure with, with pillars carved out of the bedrock and one freestanding pillar and then a human face on a kind of serpentine neck juts out of the wall of the enclosure, again cut from solid bedrock. Um, and, and, and it just creates the most strange and spooky feeling. I can't even begin to guess what the purpose of that enclosure was, but it too dates back to around 11,600, 12,000 years ago. And at Terahan Tepe, as at Gebekli Tepe, there are more structures still waiting to be excavated underground. So I think we're just scratching the surface of a huge mystery here. And it is a mystery because until the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, archaeologists were convinced that there were no older megalithic structures in the world than about 6,000 years ago. They were convinced of that. And suddenly here, more than 5,000 years older than that, 11,600 years ago, not 6,000, but 11,600 years ago, we find this enormous, highly sophisticated, very precise a megalithic structure, which is part of a series of, 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 of structures. So clearly the archaeological picture that said, you know, we couldn't have any megalithic architecture before uh, about 6,000 years ago, which dominated the, the story of megalithic architecture until the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, clearly that story is wrong, and it needs to be replaced with something else, something much more nuanced, something much more subtle, recognizing that things were going on in the Ice Age that we're only just beginning to get to grips with now. Graham, uh, this year you came out with a book called Visionary, The Mysterious Origins of Human Consciousness, where you tried to tie together what happened to the modern human mind today. How did we get here? Yeah. Well, first, first of all, to be, to be absolutely clear with, with our listeners, George, the Visionary is, is a, an updated version of a book that I published in 2005 right. called Sup- Supernatural, Meetings with the Teachers of Ancient Mankind. And it's updated in a very specific way, which is that I, that I add a foreword and an afterword to it. 
uh, updating particularly on the new science regarding the Neanderthals and um, other um, extinct human cousins such as the Denisovans. But I have a policy with any book I write, which is once the book is written, I will not change a word of the original text. Um, even if there are things subsequently that I regret in that original text or mistakes, I won't mm -hmm. change a word. I want them to stay on the record uh, so that people can follow the evolution of my thinking and my evidence if they wish to do so. So the essential central text of Supernatural is exactly the same as it was in 2005. But we have the new forward and the new afterward uh, to update uh, the, in the case of the, of the forward on, on new discoveries about the Neanderthals and the Denisovans and their ability to create uh, visionary art. Uh, and in the afterward on the new science on psychedelics, which has finally brought psychedelics out of the demon house that, that bad science put them in for the last 60 years. Psychedelics at last are beginning to shed the, the demonization of that vile and wicked enterprise called the war on drugs. They're beginning to, to shed that and are shown to be incredibly effective in, in curing people of post-traumatic stress disorder, of uh, fear of death amongst those who have a terminal cancer diagnosis, um, uh, getting people out of deep and rigid depression. Uh, the, the, these, formerly, these formerly demonized plant medicines and fungal medicines are finally beginning to make their mark in the world, and science is beginning to realize that they're incredible therapeutic agents. And this is beginning to break down the, the negative um, stereotype that had been applied to them for so long. And the point about, the point about supernatural, now retitled visionary, is, is that there was a... Uh, and I want to pay tribute to the late, great Terence McKenna here, by the way, in his book, Food of the Gods, and, 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 and also to David Lewis Williams, a professor at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, for his book, The Mind in the Cave. Um, it's, I was not the first to recognize by any means that there was a great leap forward in human cognition and in, in human intelligence at the time that the first cave art began to be painted. And that uh, cave art is classic visionary art. It is the art of shamanism. However, those painters got into an altered state of consciousness. They no doubt had experienced deeply altered states of consciousness. And the visions that they were painting on those cave walls are classic visionary art, just as is painted by shamans in the Amazon today after drinking ayahuasca. And, uh, and it seems that just like psychedelics are now being shown to be able to break people out of rigid uh, locked in behavior in depression, unable to break that cycle, psychedelics break it. It looks like psychedelics helped our ancestors to, to make a, a quantum leap forward uh, at, at some time during the Ice Age, to make a quantum leap, leap forward and to begin to behave and to understand the world in entirely different ways. So it's, it's high time our society stopped demonizing these extraordinary substances uh, and uh, uh, allowed adults to make decisions about their own consciousness, their own health, and their own bodies. It is amazing what has happened and transpired over the few years where they have demonized all of this. Yeah, I mean, for decades, George, you know, in fact, you know, still today, critics of my work say, oh, Hancock has taken psychedelics, therefore he's obviously a lunatic. <laughs> says, you know, it's used as a, it's used as a slur still today, uh, despite masses of science, which is which has revealed the incredible therapeutic potential uh, of these of these ancient medicines. So it's going to take a long time to overcome that, um, to, you know, to overcome that bias. But but it is happening. Unfortunately, and I, I'd, I'd like to make a point of this, that, that at some research institutes like Imperial College in London, they're not only investigating the therapeutic outcomes of psychedelics, but they're also looking into what psychedelics mean for our understanding of reality itself. What are the entities that individuals encounter, in, encounter uh, under the influence of, a, of a powerful dose of dimethyltryptamine, DMT, for example? Entity encounters are incredibly common uh, and very bizarre, and different volunteers report encountering the same entities. Could there be a nexus here with quantum physics and the notion of parallel realms and parallel universes, maybe altered states of consciousness are a way to access those realms and universes. Unfortunately, uh, because this is just a very exciting project, Imperial College in London are now undertaking such a project. They're, they're, they're using a new technology which allows people to stay in the DMT state for an hour. Normally, smoke DMT is a 12-minute journey. Stay in the, the DMT state for an hour. 
in Imperial College to um, conduct scans on their brains to see which parts of their brains are lighting up uh, under the influence of the DMT and crucially to interview the volunteers while they are under the influence and get them to describe the entities that they are encountering in this state. Now, of course, hard-headed uh, scientists would say, oh, those entities are just fictions of the human imagination. Maybe they are, but maybe they're not. Maybe some kind of contact is going here, going on here at the level of consciousness that uh, we have not fully understood yet, and that's why I applaud the project at Imperial College in London. What was it, Graham, that got you interested in these subjects in the beginning? It was a, it was a slow process. I, I, I mean, if I go back to the 1970s and the 1990s, I'm, I'm an old man now, George. I'm 70, 72 years old. Ah, that's so, young. Um, yeah. State of <laughs> mind. Say again, George? Your state of mind. Keep it young. Yeah, it's a state of mind that matters. It seems like yesterday when I was 36. I don't, I don't see any difference. I, I suppose I, perhaps, I hope I've learned a little bit of, of wisdom since then. But um, I was a journalist in the 70s and, and, and 80s. I was totally interested in current affairs. Um, I wasn't really interested in ancient history at all. But, but it was uh, traveling as a journalist to Ethiopia in the Horn of Africa. I'm coming across the Ethiopian claim uh, to possess the lost Ark of the Covenant. Right. It's, it's in so, some. They say it's in a church somewhere out there, right? It's in a chapel in in the the enclosure of Saint Mary of Zion in the city of Aksum in Tigray province in in northern Ethiopia. That's what they say, and um, it, it's fundamental to Ethiopian culture. So I couldn't help bumping into this tradition traveling to Ethiopia as a journalist, and I began on the on the back burner to investigate it. And as the investigator proceeded, I began to see that there was perhaps more to it than met the eye, and that archaeologists sneering at this, at this deeply held tradition of the entire uh, Ethiopian culture uh, could be wrong. Um, and this is really when I first began to doubt the absolute security of believing in what archaeologists say, because they're human beings just like you and me, and they can make mistakes, and I think they make a lot of mistakes, and I think they're making a mistake in Ethiopia. So I ended up writing a book about that, and that's what drew me into the possibility of a lost civilization. I mean, talk about ancient technology. The Ark of the Covenant has so many oh my God. aspects yeah. about it um, that it's very hard to uh, it's very hard to explain in the setting uh, in which we in which we find it, it feels like a, an, an out of place artifact. It feels like a piece of lost technology from some unknown and remote past. And that's what started me on the path of investigating the possibility of a lost civilization. And my thoughts have gone through many changes and many developments over the years. But I, I remain certain of one thing: that we are a species with amnesia. And I first used that phrase in Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995. Um, that there was a gigantic global cataclysm, uh, which wasn't an overnight event. It was 1,200 years of cataclysm between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, that sea levels ra rose all over the world, that in the, the, the best real estate on Earth was submerged. Uh, huge areas like uh, the Channel Scablands in North America were just ripped and gouged and scoured by these enormous floods coming off the North American ice cap. And this event was indeed big enough uh, to lose us a whole episode of our own story. If the Ark of the Covenant is in that chapel in Ethiopia, why don't they march it out to us? <laughs> well, you have, to, you have to understand that this is a matter that's taken extremely seriously in Ethiopia. Um, this is not some tourist thing for them. The, well, right. for, for Ethiopia, this is fundamental uh, to their to their religion, and it's curious because because Ethiopia is a very ancient Christian country, uh, and actually, uh, although it belongs to the same tradition, the Ark of the Covenant is a pre-Christian relic. It's a it, it, it's a relic of ancient Judaism. Um, so it, it's curious that in Christian Ethiopia, this relic is so venerated and held to be so sacred that that the original is kept in this chapel in Aksum, um, but copies of it. Uh, or, or in some cases replicas of the tablets of stone that were supposedly kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. These, these so-called tabots 
are kept in every single church in Ethiopia, more than 20,000 churches. And if they're removed from any church, that church is immediately deconsecrated. So this is an incredibly important issue to the Ethiopians. And they're not about to march the Ark of the Covenant out to show it to the outside world. It's up to, it's up to other people whether they choose to believe the Ethiopian story or not. I did a 500-page investigation of it, and I think there's a lot to it uh, that has been missed out by historians and archaeologists. But I can't absolutely prove it's there. What I can prove is that there's an indigenous community of Ethiopian Jews, the Falashas, who practiced an Old Testament style of Judaism until until their reconnection with the, with the modern world in, in the 1990s. Many of them are now in Israel. Um, they have uh, priests, not rabbis. They, they know the Torah, but not the Talmud. Uh, they have their own story about how the ark came to Ethiopia. It's all in my book, The Sign and the Seal, a book that I wrote many years ago, but which started me off on this, this journey into investigating mysteries in the past that archaeology prefers. To and what a journey it has been. Graham, when you were videotaping the Ancient Apocalypse series, though you had uh, outlined most of the programs, mm. did you come across anything that was surprising to you? Yes, uh, virtually everywhere we went, actually, but, but particularly fascinating is the underground cities of Turkey. Um, we have one episode in Turkey that focuses on Gobekli Tepe mm -hmm. and, and on Karahan Tepe and on these new 11,600 to 12,000-year-old discoveries of highly sophisticated megalithic sites. But a second episode in Turkey is on the so-called um, underground, underground cities. Um, and these um, are in Cappadocia, uh, and there's uh, dozens of them. And they're deeply excavated living areas cut, cut down deeply into the bedrock, like Berinkuyu and Kaimakli, for, for example, going down hundreds of feet below ground level with, with, with hundreds of rooms in some places, and, and then tunnels eight kilometers long that join one site to another, that join, for example, Berinkuyu to Kaimakli. Uh, they're the most extraordinary thing, and I feel very strongly that the, the mainstream explanation for them doesn't make sense. The mainstream explanation is that these underground cities were were built to hide from invading armies. But the last thing you want to do is to conceal yourself underground from an invading army that's come to stay, um, because all they have to do is block up the entrances, and they don't even have to fight you. That's right, and you're stuck. <laughs> you're stuck. I think these places were meant as temporary refuges from a very different kind of hazard, and that is the hazard of multiple fragments of a disintegrating comet bombarding the Earth uh, from, from the sky. This is, we reveal this in episode eight of the, of the TV series. It's called The Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. I've written about it extensively in my 2019 book, America Before, and my 2015 book, Magicians of the Gods. It's an incredibly important new science, which is showing that the Earth ran into the debris stream of a disintegrating comet around 12,800 years ago and was bombarded not by one object, not by two objects, but by thousands of objects, some of which might have been quite small, <laughs> 50 meters in diameter, others primarily landing on the North American and Northern, Northern European ice caps, may have been up to a kilometer uh, in diameter, but there were many air bursts of the smaller objects. There was one over a site we know for sure, over a site called Abu Herrera in Syria, which is just 100 miles from Gobekli Tepe. These, these air bursts of comet fragments leave iridium in the ground. They leave platinum in the ground. They leave evidence of quartz being melted at more than 2,000 degrees centigrade. These are, these are colossal uh, explosions that are taking place. And because the debris stream of a disintegrating comet is something that might take 10 or 12 days to pass through, uh, these underground shelters that are today called the underground cities make perfect places of refuge from that. So I think these underground cities are places of refuge for, for bombardments that may have lasted 12 to 14 days per episode and then stopped and then renewed again because the Earth passes through the debris stream of this comet twice a year. We still, by the way, pass through it today. It's called the Torrid Meteor Stream, and each passage takes about 12 days. So if you need to duck and hide from bombardment from the sky for 12 days, these so-called underground cities make perfect sense. And the bottom line is I think they're thousands of years older than archaeologists believe, uh, and that there's no firm dating of them at all. I think they date back to the Younger Dryas. 
Graham, if you could get into a time machine and go back into time, what era would you go to? Oh, I definitely want to go to the to the younger dry house. The, the period between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, because that's when everything changed. Uh, what we think of as history uh, really began right after that, 11,600 years ago. That's the so-called the birth of agriculture and, and the beginnings of megalithic culture in the form of Gobekli Tepe. But I don't think it was a birth at all. I think it was a rebirth. I think it was a rebooting of civilization, something very special that had existed for a very long time was destroyed in that cataclysm. There were survivors. Uh, they attempted to pass on their knowledge. Just as, just as our civilization today, were, were it to be devastated by an event or a series of events like this, would, would not survive um, because we, we're, we're too specialized. We don't have those survival skills. But the people who would survive in our world today would be the hunter-gatherers. Uh, who are in the business of survival, whether in the Amazon rainforest or, or the Namibian desert. Hunter-gatherers coexist with our so-called advanced civilization, and hunter-gatherers are the masters of survival. If our civilization were taken down, those of us who survived would be smart to take refuge amongst hunter-gatherers and share with them some of what we know and learn from them the mass of knowledge that they have about survival. And I think it's the same thing that happened at the, at the end of the Ice Age, that there were um, uh, hunter-gatherer civilizations, of course, uh, coexisting with a more advanced civilization. That advanced civilization was largely fell apart and was destroyed in the cataclysm, and its, its survivors took refuge amongst hunter-gatherers and passed on their skills and knowledge. And that's how we have this, these ancient traditions from every culture in the world, speaking of a flood, and speaking of a time when, when um, visitors from somewhere else came bringing advanced knowledge and teaching the gifts of civilization. It was the, not the beginning of civilization. It was the re-beginning. It was a restart. That's what happened during the Yoga Dryas. And if I had my time machine, that's the time I'd choose to go back and live in. I'd go back to see Jesus. I'd want to be a witness to that event. What do you think about that? Interesting thought, George. Interesting, interesting thought. Of course, of course, another pivotal figure um, who you know who changed the world. Um, whatever, whatever one 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 makes of of, of him, uh, there's there's no doubt that this was a turning point in the in, in the story of the world. Yes, uh, and, and and there's so many alternative narratives. You know, the Gnostics see Jesus in a completely different way from the way the Catholic Church. Uh, sees him, for for example, it would be very nice to go back to that period and actually see what really happened. We human beings are, are constantly creating narratives about what happened, and the job of a researcher is to explore those narratives and investigate them and see what can be stood up against the facts. I wonder if he'd come up to me and say, oh, you're that talk show host from 2022. <laughs> <laughs> well, if- with, with his, um, uh, with his uh, abilities, no doubt he'd be able to travel in time as well. Yeah, let's go to some calls. Joe in the Bronx in New York. Hey, Joseph, go ahead. George, how are you? Okay, Happy Joe, holidays, you George. too. How have you been? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Graham, uh, you mentioned the Ark of the Covenant, uh, yeah. uh, which uh, a lot of people believe uh, is housed in St. Mary's in Ethiopia. Um, yeah. If so... Why haven't the um, people in charge of the covenant selected an artifact that they can show the world to prove once and for all to the world that it is the original Ark of the Covenant that is housed there? Well, the very simple answer to that question, for them, it's the most sacred relic on earth. They don't care whether the world believes them or not. They know the truth of their own story. Uh, and they have no intention of uh, of putting it on public display. That may be very frustrating for those who want the proof, um, but the only proof that can be offered is is uh, circumstantial evidence. And I devoted 500 pages to that in my book, The Side of the Seal, trying to make the case for the Ethiopian claim. It's partly because it's the only country in the world that now claims to possess the Ark of the Covenant and that has a living tradition uh, surrounding the Ark of the Covenant, and it's partly because of the absence of good alternative sources or locations for where the Ark of the Covenant may be. One thing's for sure, it wasn't taken out by the Babylonians when they invaded Israel in 587 B.C. By 587 B.C., it was certainly already gone. And there's no question the Ark of the Covenant was a real object, right? I think it would be, it would be 
really unwise to suggest that it wasn't a real object. I agree. <laughs> it definitely was a real object, and it was an object that belongs to a category of objects. The ancient Egyptians, let's not forget that the story of Moses begins in, in, in Egypt. Moses is reared in the household of the pharaoh. Um, he's groomed to become a, a, a future pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, he would have been had access to the highest sacred knowledge in ancient Egypt. And let's not forget that in ancient Egypt there were such things as the arcs of the gods, which took the form of small boat-like objects with a shrine of the deity or sometimes a, a meteorite uh, inside them. Uh, this is this is a this is a tradition that's firmly grounded in in ancient Egypt. So there's no reason why we should expect that. that we, once we understand that the ancient Egyptians had the had their arcs of the gods, and these two were considered to be powerful and dangerous objects, it uh, it becomes absurd to suggest that the Ark of the Covenant, which has its origins in ancient Egypt, was not uh, a, a real object. Of course, it was real. What does that tell you about the Bible, Graham? where the Ark of the Covenant was real, the flood of Noah was real. What does that tell you about the Bible? I think like any compendium of ancient wisdom, uh, we need to use discernment and intelligence in using the Bible as a resource uh, for our investigations. The Bible is full of extraordinary witness. It's full of an enormous amount of truth about the past. But it's not entirely free from storytelling and fiction either. So we have, to, we have to use discernment in our study of the Bible. And what I find particularly compelling, uh, first of all, because of the beautiful language of the Bible, it's preserved these ancient traditions in a, in a form which, which really reaches to the, to the human heart. First of all, the beautiful language of the Bible. But what I find particularly compelling is when biblical narratives uh, correlate precisely with narratives from elsewhere in the world that were not exposed to the Judeo-Christian tradition. There I see uh, a, a legacy, a common shared legacy, spread out around the world and manifesting in various forms of sacred literature all around the world, of which, of which the Judeo-Christian Bible is only one. There are, many, there are many others, and we should treat them all with equal respect. We should not regard one as superior to and we should not regard another as inferior to. They are all equally valuable, important sources of knowledge from different cultures all around the world. In the case of the Bible, we have it beautifully preserved in beautiful language, but it's not superior to any other ancient tradition. First-time caller Darren in Ohio is with us. Hi, Darren. Yes, uh, good, uh, good evening, good morning, however it is. Uh, First-time caller, long-time listener, found... And I'm finding this uh, program terribly fascinating. I wanted to know if uh, Mr. Hancock and going back to the Serpent Mound, uh, being from Ohio, have been at the Serpent Mound numerous times. If uh, if Mr. Hancock is aware that that is upon a meteorite site. Yes, I am. It's, it's, it's what yeah. they call a crypto-explosive structure, that there was an, an enormous cosmic impact there. Um, yes. which created a huge crater system with rings. You can even see them, the rings on the distant horizon when you're looking from... Uh, oh, from really? I did not, I'm not aware of that. You that can, yeah, the, this, there was an, an enormous meteorite impact there, asteroid or, or comet impact there, um, millions of years ago in the past. And I think, I think the, the genius Native American people who created Serpent Mound were aware of that. I think they had far more knowledge than archaeologists would give them credit for. Oh, that's beautiful. That Thank is, you for I think that. that yes, is carefully sorry. chosen. Sorry. Yes, and so if you ever want to go to the Serpent Mound, just see me. We'll go up there together. That's great. So uh, that sorry that you well, couldn't get in. It's a beautiful place. I was I was gutted that they that they that they're so protective of their particular interpretation of the history of Serpent Mound that they wouldn't even allow me into the site, the Ohio History Collection. That they actually closed the gates to me and wouldn't allow me in just because my point of view differs from theirs. That's and crazy. America, the home of freedom of speech. They treated you like a demon. 
Yes, absolutely, absolutely. In general, in general these days, that's how archaeology treats me. Uh, and at the same time, they imagine that I want their, their approval. I don't want their approval. I'm offering an alternative point of view, and I'm documenting, and I'm thoroughly backing up that alternative point of view. And that's how, why I'm gra- glad that my series, Ancient Apocalypse, has reached tens of millions of people, because this information cannot be suppressed anymore. Graham, why are these groups, organizations, archaeologists, why are they so upset with you? So you've got different views. Big deal. Yeah, I know. This is it's quite astonishing to me as well. And although it shouldn't be, because the different, it's at a crescendo at the moment. But it, I've been subjected to this for, for, for thirty years, really, in in my investigations. I don't think that fundamentally it's some kind of gigantic conspiracy to cover up knowledge about the past. I don't think that's what's going on. Although denying me access to film in Serpent Mound and denying me access to film in Egypt effectively does cover up some knowledge about the past. But I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think it's because, like any professional body, archaeologists get invested in their own ideas. Um, They have devoted their careers to a particular model of prehistory. That model of prehistory has no room for a lost civilization of the Ice Age. When somebody comes along and starts to make a convincing case for a lost civilization of the Ice Age, backs it up with thousands of references in his books uh, and makes uh, an eight-episode TV series on Netflix that is viewed all over the world and that is seen by tens of millions of people, they feel threatened. The archaeologists feel threatened. They, they feel the ground moving under their feet, uh, and they don't want this to happen. So they go to, they go to extreme lengths to, to try, basically, to try and get me off the air. The, you know, the society Unbelievable. For American archaeology writing an open letter, you know, wanting, to have, wanting to have my series reclassified as fiction. How insulting. My series is full of experts, indigenous experts, experts from all over the world who, who, who speak of the antiquity of these sites. Um, how, how, how dare the Society for American Archaeology try to get this censored in any way? It speaks to me of a discipline that's, that's really afraid, of, afraid of facing alternative views, in, unconfident of its own position. One of my main uh, critics um, uh, who, who has spent 30 years in, in insulting me online, um, who's one of the lead uh, group uh, accusing me of spreading white supremacism and racism in my Ancient Apocalypse TV series, even though race is never mentioned in the series. Uh, When I um, proposed a public uh, debate with him, uh, uh, when I proposed that to him just uh, two days ago, uh, he declined. So he's willing to insult me from behind the safety of his keyboard. That's that's how they hide. But he's not willing to meet face-to-face and actually have this thrash us out as as a debate. It's crazy times, Graham, isn't it? Yeah. Let's go to Linda in Spokane, Washington. Go ahead, Linda. Good morning, George. So Father Time says. <laughs> um, it never stops. I know. I know. Good old Father Time and Mother Nature. Anyways, um, one comment before I talk to uh, Graham, I just read a book that said Mary Magdalene was from Ethiopia and studied with Jesus in India. Anyways, um, Graham, I read your book, Entangled, and I Mm -hmm. heard recently that the aliens or an ET race or ancestors took Neanderthal and Cro-Magnum and spliced through their cells 62 times to create humans Mm -hmm. to uh, telepathically insert technology into their minds so they... Well, I don't think technology is needed. I I, I think it's very clear that the ancestors of anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals uh, were um, interbreeding quite extensively. And, it's a theory of the Anunnaki, isn't it, Graham? Many modern populations have up to 5% of Neanderthal DNA and up to 4% of Denisovan DNA. I, I actually don't need the Anunnaki for this. We are talking about, though, number one, his Netflix series, Ancient Apocalypse. Who came up with that name? Did you, Graham? That's great. 
Actually, no, I didn't. Um, that that suggestion came from from Netflix and from ITN Productions, the the, the production company. Um, we uh, took a long time to arrive at it, but it is the bottom line of this series, and that's why it makes sense that we what it comes down to, uh, and and what desperately needs to be understood by archaeologists is the gigantic extent of the cataclysm that took place at the end of the Ice Age and how radically it reshaped our world. And archaeology cannot claim to have the keys to the truth about the whole of the human past while it ignores the implications of that ancient apocalypse. Uh, and that's what we reveal in, in episode eight uh, of the series with the gradual, the gradual build-up to that and the evidence that makes sense of it, the running into the debris stream of a fragmented, disintegrating comet, the bombardments all over the Earth, the evidence in the Younger Dryas boundary layer, this layer of, of soot and burnt Earth all around the world which contains nanodiamonds that are created in the shock and heat of the impact, which contains melted quartz that only melts at temperatures above 2,000 degrees centigrade, carbon microspherules, platinum, iridium, all of these are signatures of, of a global bombardment of fragments of a disintegrating comet, and, and it's, it's right there at the roots of the time that we think of as the beginning of history, and my point is that it's not the beginning, it's a re-beginning, it's a, it's a rebooting of the human story, and we've missed a hugely important episode, and I hope that the series will draw more attention to that idea, get mm -hmm. more people thinking about that idea, uh, and uh, perhaps, who knows, even encourage uh, eventually some archaeologists to actually investigate that idea instead of sneering at it. And we were talking before the break about the possible seeding of what creatures might have been on this planet that turned into humans, uh, part of the Zechariah Sitchin theory of the Anunnaki. Not my theory, George, I have to say. Yeah. Not my theory. I need to be clear. I knew Zachariah. He was a great man. I once had the privilege of driving him from Stonehenge to London. Um, he but, was passionate about his work. But and, you're professional uh, enough to listen to the other side, unlike some of these other people who don't want to listen you to you. Yeah, you bet. I'm, I want to listen to every side. I want to hear what everybody's got to say. And I spent a lot of time, by the way, listening to what archaeologists have to say. And if people actually read my books, if these critics actually read my books, <laughs> instead, of, instead of just pouring scorn on them, they'd find that I'm quoting mainstream archaeological papers, academic papers published in top scientific journals all around the world that I, that I give hundreds and in some cases thousands of references to such papers. The only difference is that I interpret the evidence uh, in a different way from archaeologists. We're looking at the same evidence, um, and I'm offering an alternative interpretation based on 30 years of, 30 years of, of independent study. Um, I, I have taught myself how to do this, and I think some of the best study is that way. I want to pay tribute to my friend and colleague, Randall Carlson, uh, you know, a self-made uh, geologist. He's a, he, 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 he builds houses by, by profession, but he's a master of geology, and he's made himself that through self-study. Let's, let's realize that the citizen, the everyday person, the man in the street, the woman in the street, is capable of contributing as much to the understanding of our past as the so-called elite archaeologists from Ivy League universities. We all have a share in knowing about the truth of our past, and we all have light to shed on that. And every view is welcome, because at the moment, yep. it's a great unknown. I think they're jealous of you, Graham. Well, there may be an element of... There may be an element of that, um, I, sus I suspect. Uh, it, seems, um, uh, it seems that this Netflix show has particularly annoyed them um, because they would rather that the budget for the show had been given to a mainstream archaeologist to tell us to them. yet again That's right. the mainstream position, which we've been told repeatedly, endlessly, from the moment we entered school until the moment that we'd listened to any mainstream media program. Let's go to Gabriel in Brooklyn, New York. Go ahead, Gabe. Thanks for calling. Yes, um, I'd like to say, Mr. Nori, I love your show. Your show is my company when I'm working at Night Shift in Brooklyn. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, and that was my dad's name, by the way. Oh, wow. <laughs> it made my day. It made my night, I mean. Um, Mr. Hancock, I have um, yeah. a number of your books, and I'm currently reading Magic of the Gods. The question that I have is, what is your take on um, Adam's calendar? which is found in South Africa. Um, yeah, it's a um, very interesting site. I've, I've actually been there with Michael Tellinger, 
Um, and um, I've been to some of the other. Um, the, Adam, Adam's calendar is particularly interesting because it, it, it's clearly and genuinely a, a megalithic site. Um, the, the other sites that, that Michael is interested in, I'm not so sure. Um, however, uh, I, 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 my, my, my approach really has not been to go further or more deeply into that particular mystery. I have so many other mysteries that I'm engaged in where I have more material at hand that I feel more urgently needs to be put out. But I keep an open mind on the whole Adam's calendar story. I think there's... I think that Africa is one of the great underserved areas by archaeology. There's been too little archaeology in in Africa, uh, not only in South Africa, but across the continent. Just think about the Sahara Desert. That's 9 million square kilometers. That's hardly been studied by archaeology at all. (laughs) And yet they claim to have complete knowledge uh, of, uh, or, or, or if not to have complete knowledge, to be the experts whom we should solely consult. Uh, about our past. Uh, there's many mysteries in, in Africa. I'd like to see more work done on Adam, Adam's calendar. It's just not a mystery yeah. that I've it's in, it's in South Africa, isn't it? It's in South Africa, yes. Yeah. And it's like Stonehenge a little bit, isn't it? Uh, in the sense that there's a series of standing uh, columns, yes. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a megalithic site of standing stones. Next up, let's go to Joe, Long Island, New York. Hey, Joseph, go ahead. Hey, Grant, a couple of questions. First is, you know, you were talking about the hunter-gatherer survivalists and possibly, you know, very advanced technology people. Would they have had, you know, I'm generalizing a different approach to thinking about the supernatural and using the supernatural? Oh, yes. Yes, uh, I think so. This is This is one of the reasons why I always say, we shouldn't look for ourselves in the past because our civilization has got particular hallmarks. And and one of the hallmarks of our civilization is the absolute refusal to believe in anything that can't be weighed or measured or counted. So so our civilization rejects the supernatural and does not investigate it. It, it, It wants to look for physical explanations for everything, and thus our civilization sneers at human capacities like uh, telepathy, uh, even though there's been good scientific work done, for example, by Rupert Sheldrake, which shows that uh, telepathy does uh, exist. I think the ancient civilization that I'm talking about pursued a very different path to our own, um, and I think that path included what would be recognized as psychic powers today. Oddly enough, in my books, I don't say more than two or three pages about this, but whenever my critics want to attack me, they say, oh, Hancock believes in psychic powers of the ancients. Well, I just think it's an interesting inquiry, but Mm -hmm. it's not what I devote my books to. First time caller, Joe in New Jersey. Hey, Joe, go ahead. Uh, Yes, uh, I'm going to be uh, in January 2nd, 77. I was uh, listening to this guy. I don't know if you ever heard of him. His name is George Lindsay, and he wrote a a book on history. And he goes all the way back to the Polarians. Uh, He mentioned first the people from Atlantis. Then he mentioned the people from Lemuris. The people from Lemuris were uh, Morphodites, and they had like an eye in the middle middle of their forehead. Who is this this book by? I don't know this author. George Lindsay. Don't know him. George Lindsay. And then he mentioned these people named the Hyperboreans, and they look like the cavemen, and that's when they brought in borders. And then they mentioned before that people called Polarians, and they didn't speak orally. They spoke with their minds, and they had no borders at that time. And uh, I'm, I'm calling up to mention that. Uh, did you ever— well, Thank you for, thank you you for adding before. that to the, to, to the, to the discussion. I, I wasn't aware of that book, but I'll check it out. Interesting take. Lots of different theories out there, Graham. Yes, because the past is truly the great unknown, uh, and we need lots of theories. We need to investigate it in, 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 in many different ways. Why did we lose the knowledge? What, what happened well, to transition? I think, I, I think it's the Younger Dryas. I think it's this, and it's very important to be clear, this wasn't just an overnight cataclysm. This was 1,200 years of horror that afflicted the earth. Uh, and, and, you know, we can see the, the fingerprint of that in the extinction of the, of the Ice Age megafauna. Uh, at that at that time, this was such a severe event that uh, I think it literally knocked humanity on the head. We uh, we got concussion um, and we forgot stuff about ourselves. And desperate efforts were made to preserve that forgotten material. I think Gobekli Tepe is part of that. I think it's a I think it's a hall of records. I think it's a, a, a 
time capsule sent sent down to the future. But the the cataclysm was so massive and its effects were were global um, that it wasn't possible to make a complete recovery. Uh, and and we became a, a species with, uh, with 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 amnesia. However, there are these guidelines that the wise ancients left us with traditions that have been passed down and and, and monuments in stone like the Great Pyramid. Uh, which, again, archaeology ignores this or dismisses it as a coincidence, but, you know, the Great Pyramid is uh, a scale model of the northern hemisphere of the Earth. If you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 43,200, you get the polar radius of the Earth, and if you take its base perimeter and multiply by the same number, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth, and this is a monument that weighs 6 million tons, and that's aligned to within... To, to, to just a fraction of a single degree uh, to, to, to true north. It's uh, incredibly precise, 13-acre footprint, perfectly aligned to true, true north, encodes the dimensions of the Earth. None of this can be explained by the mainstream model of, of history. We've definitely forgotten something about our past. Um, I think every effort to investigate that from all different points of view is to be welcomed. Let's go to Matt in Wisconsin. Go ahead, Matt. Thanks. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to talk to you, gentlemen. Thank um, you. I spent some time in Lebanon in uh, temples of Baalbek. Oh, wow. Beautiful places. Yes, go on. Yeah, I was going to see if you ever wanted to go there. I could get you access to all these temples. And you well, can tell cool. No, I've different. been there. And in my 2015 book, uh, Magicians of the Gods, uh, I wrote extensively about Baalbek which, in my opinion, is one of the most mysterious sites in the world. Um, it's disguised by the Roman Temple of Jupiter, which leads people to believe that it's entirely a Roman construction. But the Romans were building on top of much older foundations, and those foundations include gigantic megaliths uh, in the walls itself, weighing up to 900 tons in the so-called Trilithon, and in the quarry, uh, even larger blocks weighing uh, up to 1,600 tons. Uh, there's something just completely magnificent and unspeakable and unimaginable about Baalbek. And uh, I was privileged uh, to to go there and to spend a good deal of time there and to come back and, and present a, a report in in that 2015 book, um, Magicians of the Gods. Graham, do you think Baalbek could be a landing port? No, I don't think it's a landing port. Um, I... <laughs> I think that's an unnecessary theory. Um, if you can, I mean, let's take the hypothesis that visitors from another star system have have, have come to Earth. Right. Um, they, they they've come in incredibly high tech vehicles. Uh, they've crossed interstellar space. They've 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 navigated their way to this pale blue dot, mm -hmm. and yet they need a landing uh, a landing platform. <laughs> I, I don't think so. No. I think their tech would be way beyond needing any kind of landing platform anywhere. I just think that's a really bad idea, which, which, which detracts from the actual mystery of Baalbek, which is the incredible size of the megaliths there. Uh, just, just unimaginable, huge, gigantic blocks of stone, which were, were moved into position in uh, ways that we just do not get. How many years did I introduce you to the, to the uh, St. Louis group? when you did your book signing? Gosh, George, I'm getting old and long in the tooth. <laughs> I don't remember how long ago that was. At least a few years, wasn't it? Yeah, well, we've known each other for a long time, George. Yes, we have, my friend. And uh, we're wrapping things up. Where do people get your books now? Where can they go? Well, the easiest place is on Amazon. I'm happy to say that I've, I've narrated most of my books, and um, that's why one of the reasons why we retitled Supernatural as Visionary, um, because it gave me the opportunity to get rid of the old third-party narrator and narrate that book myself. I've narrated my 29 book, 2019 book, 2019 book America Before, my 2015 book Magicians of the Gods. I've narrated my best-known book, Fingerprints of the Gods, um, and all of these are available on, on Audible on um, Amazon.com. Um, and, of course, as print books as well. Super. Thank but you, Graham, pleased, for being I'm on the pleased, show. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to narrate my own books because I know what I want to emphasize. Absolutely. Graham Hancock watches Netflix series called Ancient Apocalypse. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. 
You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.